Howdy, it's Kyle talking about natural disasters and the worst places in the US for them. There have been many disasters that have happened in the past several years all over the news. We've seen so much damage from different types of events. So here I wanna talk about the different types of disasters we have in the US and what are the worst places geographically for them. So hurricanes make the most news in the summer and fall. We've, As I'm recording this, it's been hurricanes that have been making the most news, but it might be wildfires, it might be floods, it might be a tornado outbreak. So I wanna take a look at just the parts of the country where it's the worst for all of these. And as a result, also which places are the best. And I've about three years ago, I posted a video similar to this, so there will be some overlap with that one, but it has been three years, so I think it is worth going over some stuff again. But yeah, let's take a look at the worst places in the U.S. for natural disasters. I'm going to talk about hurricanes first. They've been in, in the news a lot lately, and of all the major multi-billion dollar type disasters that affect the U.S., hurricanes are the most common. Hurricanes are tropical cyclones, which are the largest storms on Earth in terms of area, and they form in tropical waters on different parts of the planet. Hurricanes rely on warm water for fuel, so where you have the warmest water is where you're going to have the highest risk for hurricanes. And for the U.S., this is of course going to be the Gulf Coast and the southern portions of the Atlantic Coast. Not everywhere in a coastal county in the south, even in Florida, will be inundated with storm surge even during the most powerful hurricane. And because of that, storm surge is where you have the largest number of fatalities in a hurricane normally, and you don't have as many fatalities interior, but you do have much more flooding. So you can have a lot of heavy rain being dumped in some of these low-lying areas. So you don't have to be right along the coast in the south to have your areas flooded because the rivers are going to be flooded, the creeks are going to be rising. You go back to this map and you'll see some purple up in the Chesapeake Bay all the way up to Long Island. A Category 2 or even 3 hurricane could make landfall at Ocean City, Maryland and go up the Chesapeake. Even though the winds wouldn't be as strong, there could be just as much rain and just as much flooding. The water isn't likely warm enough for a major Category 4 or 5 to make landfall that far north, but the buildings up there aren't as well rated for hurricane force winds either. And plus, people in Maryland and Delaware, New Jersey, and New York probably aren't prepared for a hurricane evacuation. So here's a rundown of just how many hurricanes have affected the U.S. since 2000. In the past 24 years, there have been 45 hurricanes make landfall in the U.S. Of those 45, 18 were Category 1, 9 were Category 2, 9 were Category 3, 7 were Category 4, and 2 were Category 5. And this is just hurricanes. This doesn't count all the tropical storms that can do a ton of damage as well through flooding. And sure, some of these hurricanes didn't really do much damage. Those Category 1s really don't do a whole lot. But there have been 17 hurricanes make landfall in the U.S. that were Category 3 or greater since 2000. To put that in perspective, in the previous 30-year stress between 1970 and 2000, there were 42 hurricanes. So 45 in the past 24 years and 42 in the previous 30 years. If the frequency of hurricanes remains the same through the rest of this decade, this current 30-year period that we're in will have about 52 hurricanes, whereas the 1970-2000 to 2000 stress would have had 42. That's a 20% increase in hurricane frequency just in the past 30 years. Of the 45 hurricanes that have made landfall since 2000, 15 have been in Florida, so exactly one-third, 10 in Louisiana, 8 in North Carolina, 7 in Texas, 2 in Alabama, and 1 in New York. As we saw in 2012 with Hurricane Sandy making landfall at New York, doing a ton of damage in New Jersey as well. This was only a Category 1, but this area isn't as well prepared for a hurricane as spots in the south. The 45th was Hurricane Maria that made landfall at Puerto Rico as well as other Caribbean islands. So that brings up some interesting questions about should we keep rebuilding in Florida and South Louisiana? Right now, you'll hear some whispering about Florida being uninhabitable. Well, that's not true, but by the end of the century, it might very well be uninhabitable there. It's kind of like we're driving down a road that we know dead ends. It's a very beautiful drive for the next few miles, but we do know it's going to dead end eventually. So whether or not we continue to rebuild in Florida and South Louisiana after all of these storms, that might be more of a philosophical discussion than a political one. In terms of an overall hurricane hazard, you can be anywhere along the Gulf Coast or the Atlantic Coast, especially in the south, and have vulnerability to hurricanes, and you don't have to be along the coast. You can be just inland as well to have all that flooding. But in most of the south, you do have a little bit of topography, so it isn't so flat or such a large swath. So Louisiana is basically one giant floodplain, and so is Florida. And with a rising sea level, you also have a rising water table. That means more sinkholes in the Orlando area. 
So from a hurricane standpoint, certainly Florida is the worst place to be in the country, but there are other spots that are just as bad, but also hurricanes aren't the only hazard. What else we got? On this map, you'll see some pink in coastal New England. What's up with that? These are the counties where you're most vulnerable to a nor'easter, and even Long Island could be colored pink on this map. And this is very similar to a hurricane. It's a large storm system rotating counterclockwise. So even though these don't happen during the same time of year that hurricanes do, the damage can be fairly similar with storm surge and high winds. A nor'easter doesn't need warm water to strengthen. It strengthens by having a greater difference in temperature and pressure between two colliding air masses. So in that regard, it's almost like a thunderstorm type system where you have relatively warmer water over the sea colliding with a much colder air mass over the land. And these have been known to do all kinds of damage, especially in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Maine, where they can do pretty much damage anywhere on the coastal north. And with rising sea surface temperatures, there's going to be a larger chance for more nor'easters to affect the northeast. There's a lot of flooding from hurricanes, but most of flooding in the U.S. is just good old river and flooding. So you'll see the huge river basins on this map, but certainly many other places in the country can flood. There are all kinds of small creeks, all kinds of rivers that can flood. You get plenty of flash floods in desert areas and really steep mountainous areas. But what I'm showing on this map are these huge wide swaths of these giant rivers with their giant floodplains. So you get these huge Midwestern floods that occur when there's a combination of a ton of rain but also a ton of snow melt. So these usually occur in the spring and just dump a ton of water into these rivers and they just slowly rise. These types of massive floods are most common in the northern Great Plains, especially Iowa and the Dakotas. But you can live in one of these counties that's right along the river and never see any kind of flood water. So you can be in Dubuque, Iowa on one of those high bluffs looking at the beautiful river while so much around you is flooded. So not every part of these counties colored blue is going to be completely underwater, but a lot of it will be. And even if somebody's house wasn't damaged, the power might be out, the water might not be safe to drink, the hospital might be working off of generator power, and the schools might be closed. So people can live in coastal parts of the south and these big flood areas in the Midwest, but have their property just higher up elevation where it's going to be above what gets flooded. But again, the whole region is going to be affected. So you're going to be heavily affected whether or not your actual property was damaged. Some of the major rivers you'll see on this map are the Mississippi, the Missouri, the Red, the Cedar, and the Iowa. But there are many other rivers that can flood, but these are kind of the big ones that have the wide swath floods. So as you may have gathered, water is by far the biggest concern in terms of natural disasters in the U.S., whether it be tropical systems or big river and floods. But that's not the only way that meteorology gets us. We also have huge, severe thunderstorms, including tornadoes. For the purpose of this video, I'm not going to get too much into tornadoes because they can happen just about anywhere in the eastern two-thirds of the U.S. So tornadoes can occur in New England and Appalachia, even though they are less likely to be there. But basically anywhere in the Great Plains or the southeast, you can get one. You may have heard about the shift in Tornado Alley where the worst places to be for these severe storms used to be Nebraska, Kansas, but now it's shifting more towards Mississippi and Alabama. The risk is still very real in the Great Plains, of course, but it's becoming much more of a concern in the southeast. But for a tornado, the best way to be safe is to not so much not be in a certain part of the country, but to be in a much safer building. So you can't really say avoid this or that part of the country because of tornadoes. It can happen in so many spots. Again, they are more likely in some areas, but it's more about just being aware of the situation and making sure you're safe at that exact time when a major storm is occurring. The next hazard I'm going to discuss are wildfires. You think about the parts of the country where wildfires are most likely to occur, it's almost the exact opposite as where tornadoes are likely to occur. Wildfires are going to occur no matter what, whether people are living somewhere or not. So it becomes, are people living close to where the fires are occurring? The damages from fires where you see homes being burned, this always occurs at the urban-rural interface where the urban built-up human area meets the woods. People can live in the West and be very safe from wildfires, but they have to be very careful with where their property is and their just land situation. Things like having defensible space around your property or maybe cutting down a couple of trees where if they caught on fire and fell over onto your house, they'd light your house on fire as well. So if the only way to achieve safety from a wildfire would be to completely clear cut the forest around it, well, that's not a very good spot to be living. So for people that live in the West where it's very mountainous, it's not advisable to be in some of these canyons or these narrow ravines that can funnel winds coming through that can make a wildfire much worse. But the West isn't the only part of the country where you can have a lot of wildfires. You also get quite a few in Florida. 
with it being so hot there, you can have dry drought type conditions and the ground is just very dry and it can go up in flames. But one huge difference between wildfires and the other hazards is that a fire can be stopped while it's occurring. It might be extremely difficult, take tons of resources, but it is possible. With that being said, that should not be relied upon. Living in a wooded part of the West with not much clearing is just as dangerous as living right along the coast in Florida. So those are the meteorological disasters, the ones that we know happen at certain times of the year. But what about the geologic disasters, the ones that can happen any time? The first one would be an earthquake. Earthquakes are most likely to occur along plate tectonic boundaries. So this is why you have so many along the West Coast. This is where the Pacific Plate meets the North American Plate. But even along the West Coast, earthquakes aren't evenly distributed. You have a lot more in California than Oregon, and you have a lot more in Alaska than Washington. But one thing about West Coast earthquakes is that the damage doesn't extend really far inland. Because of the underlying geology, you're not going to feel the shaking for a huge radius. Compare that to the eastern U.S. If there were to be a five-point earthquake in upstate New York, people will feel it hundreds of miles away. But there are parts of California where there is a very small earthquake risk, including where I'm from. My mom is in her 70s. She's lived in California her whole life and has never been through an earthquake. But with that being said, the actual coast itself and the Mojave Desert is very susceptible to a big earthquake. When a big earthquake happens, it's a huge disaster that causes billions of dollars worth of damage, but fortunately they don't happen anywhere near as often as hurricanes. There have been two fairly large earthquakes that did some decent damage in California this century, one in Napa and another in Paso Robles. But neither one of these were huge, major, widespread disasters, and the last multi-billion dollar major earthquake to happen in California was 30 years ago. So both Los Angeles and the San Francisco Bay Area are well overdue for an earthquake, but of all other disasters, there's not really a whole lot you can do in terms of preparedness. You can mitigate the damage by having stronger buildings and with stronger structural codes, but the earthquake is still just going to happen without warning. But it is worth noting that it isn't just the West Coast that is at risk for a major earthquake. There's also the region of western Wyoming, southeastern Idaho, and northern Utah with a decent number of earthquakes. And in the eastern U.S., there are two main spots for a potential large earthquake. One is the New Madrid area, which is the region surrounding the Missouri Boot Heel just north of Memphis, Tennessee. And the biggest spot for concern for an earthquake along the East Coast would be Charleston, South Carolina. And of course, you can have huge earthquakes in Alaska. The only nine-point earthquakes in recorded U.S. history has been in Alaska. And also interesting is that the island of Kauai is the only one of the major Hawaiian islands that is not seismically active. And well, Hawaii and seismic activities is a nice segue to the next thing I'm going to talk about. That's volcanoes. This is the hazard we hear about the least because they happen by far the least often. There are two types of major volcanic eruptions. One is a shield volcano. This is what you have in Hawaii. On the big island, you have Mount Kilauea. People can actually go there and just watch this volcano erupt. And even though the eruption can be large and it can spill lava kind of like a flood, it doesn't have anywhere near the explosive type violence that an eruption would have in the Pacific Northwest. And when you get to this part of the country, the Cascade Mountain Range and into Alaska, this is where you have the large composite volcanoes. These are the ones that when they erupt can do a ton of damage. The last major volcanic eruption that did any type of damage in the U.S. was Mount St. Helens in 1980. So it's pushing 50 years since the last major volcanic eruption in the U.S. Many folks don't think it can happen. However, of all other disasters, this one is by far the easiest one to pinpoint where they're going to occur. You can have a hurricane in Maine. You can have a hurricane in San Diego. You can have a tornado in Alaska, a wildfire in a swamp, an earthquake in Tennessee. But I guarantee you, you're not going to have a volcanic eruption in Indiana. So pretty simple here. If you want to be safe from a volcano, don't live near one. And because of the westerly wind belt that we are in the contiguous U.S., if you are downwind of a volcanic eruption, you will be more affected than you are if you're upwind. But unlike an earthquake, a volcanic eruption isn't just going to happen. There will be a warning for it. People will be able to evacuate. So those are the main hazards that can affect the U.S. Put that all together and what are the worst places in the country in which to live. With water being the biggest concern for disasters, if you're in an area where you're more likely to be affected by hurricanes and flooding, it's going to be worse than places that are affected more by geologic disasters. From a purely natural disaster standpoint, you would have to say that Hawaii is the worst state from a state level. They have earthquakes, volcanoes, fires, floods, tsunamis. I mean, you name it, they have it there. But amongst the 48 contiguous states, the worst one is going to be Florida. And it's not just one individual storm. It's the fact that there are so many of them that happen. Again, there have been 15 hurricanes make landfall in Florida this century. 
But with that being said, not every part of Florida is equally vulnerable to hurricanes. The northeastern portion of the state is much less likely to be affected than the southwestern portion. Louisiana is almost in the same situation, but it's mainly just the southern half of the state that's like that, but that is where most of the people in the state live. But you also have to be wary of places that are vulnerable to multiple disasters. Again, Charleston, South Carolina is at a high risk for a hurricane, but also at a medium risk for earthquakes. The Boot Hill of Missouri, high risk for flooding, moderate risk for earthquakes. The coastal portions of California, high risk for earthquake, high risk for wildfire. The coastal portions of Texas, high risk for hurricanes, high risk for severe weather. Or say Iowa, high risk of this river flooding, high risk of that river flooding. As a general rule, water causes the most amount of damage in a natural disaster, so the safest places from disasters are going to be the places that have no water. Think about places like the Grand Canyon and the national parks of Utah. You don't have any natural disasters there, but there's no water either. With canals and aqueducts and pipes and ocean desalination plants, you can engineer your way out of a drought. But kind of like with wildfires, if you have to cut down the entire forest to be safe, well, it's not safe. So for the desert, if you have to truck in a bunch of water, pipe in a bunch of water, well, that's not good. So you put it all together, and what are the safest parts of the U.S.? Well, they're going to be the non-floodplain portions of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. As long as you're not in the floodplain in those three states and not right along one of the lakes itself, you're pretty safe for most natural disasters. And yeah, you can get a tornado up there, and even for people up there, there can be a blizzard that is just too much for them to handle. But overall, if you want to be safe from a natural disaster, get yourself out of a floodplain in Minnesota, Wisconsin, or Michigan. So that was my look at the worst places in the U.S. for natural disasters, and with water creating the most damage amongst all the hazards, the places that have excess amounts of water are where you're going to have the most concern for natural disasters, whether it be coastal hurricane zones or river and floodplains. This is where it's going to be the worst. And a great way to take a look at your hydrologic and geologic vulnerability, you can look at these wonderful physical geography maps by Mirror Way. I'll leave a link in the description to their website. You can use the coupon code for 12% off your purchase. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give me a thumbs up to let me know you approved. And subscribe to this channel if you're interested in learning more about geography from a nerd. But yeah, thanks for watching. Geography King, signing out. I'd like to give a special thanks to my superior patrons for their support, especially Ben W. Welcome to the club. If you're interested in supporting the channel, you can check out my Patreon page. The link is in the description. As always, thank you very much.